Hello, YouTube. Skeptical Root. It's the totally unnecessary hand symbol, sig sign, hand sign there. You, me. Uh, maybe that'll be a thing. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, anyway, the, the I, I don't want to do a channel about response videos yet. I'm not at that point. I want to kind of outline my positions on, on topics, get them out there, and then apply those to people who I see later on and perhaps change my opinion on them. But I want to kind of make a, a record of where I stand now before I start doing that. Uh, I have my list here. I started writing down ideas uh, on this post-it here that I'll get to. But today I'm going to kind of do uh, a response video and it's going to be a two for one uh, because one, I don't, want to let it go and everybody and their mother is doing a video about it. I don't want to do a video about it, but I got to bring it up. I got to say my piece about it because I've got a YouTube channel and I can. Uh, the other one is something that's actually on my list, but it's also in relation to a response to something that someone else has said. So uh, first off, Steve Shives, your, your five toxic things about YouTube atheism is a terrible video. Uh, it is overarching, overbearing, overreaching. Uh, it's terribly collectivist. You throw yourself, I mean, you, you basically start off by saying, you know, I'm a YouTube atheist and I hope you don't think too poorly of me, but YouTube atheists are horrible people. What, what is that? I'm a YouTube atheist, you've never met me. I've never, I don't think I've said anything even so far on this channel that you would necessarily disagree with without possibly hearing me out in some of my positions because I haven't made a whole lot of stuff clear uh, except in the narrow focus of the videos that I've done so far. Why would I be lumped into this, this and really this comes down to your response video to the amazing atheist and you won't even mention his name in the whole thing. Because every point of the five, one of the five points you mentioned is something that has gone on with the Amazing Atheist in the last couple of weeks, even. Um, even some of the, the, the more broader trends that you talk about, uh, sexism and racism and things like that. When you're talking about sexism, why do you point out that 90% of the YouTube atheists are men? What does that have to do with sexism? Is it because women aren't getting on YouTube? We're, we're, men are preventing women from getting on YouTube and talking about atheism? I don't think so. I do believe from the demographics that I've seen with people's representations, uh, most of the atheists that are out there are men. Uh, and there tends to be, I don't want to say most YouTubers are men, but the, the more controversial topics that get talked about tend to be men's channels. And there is a tendency for uh, a little bit of narcissism with having a YouTube channel in the first place. That narcissism tends to be slightly more male oriented of a mental state than a female state. That might have something to do with it. Maybe it's sexual dimorphism. I'm listening to see if I can hear someone yelling uh, Thunderfoot's name in the background. Uh, it's possible. Be that as it may, I, I think you have done... What you should have done is, instead of saying five toxic things about YouTube atheism, if you had a problem with TJ, as in The Amazing Atheist, make a video to TJ. Make a video about TJ. Uh... Don't make it into this broader group of people that has nothing to do with, with particularly with, with TJ's positions. Um, there's, I'm sure you're the circle of friends that you now associate with, where there's still a lot of atheists in there. They, you've now lumped them all together with it. It's, it's, how is that any different than people thinking that all Muslims are terrorists? You know, honestly, uh, 
that is all I'm really going to say about it. I, I'm not going to sit here and do a, a dissection of the video or anything like that. That's it bothered me, and it made me want to do a response video, and I'm not doing that yet. So, but the other thing I want to talk about was uh, with another YouTuber slash blogger uh, slash. Uh, person involved in, in content on YouTube. Uh, that is Dr. I don't know if it's Dr. Or if it's Professor. Uh, or if those terms, in his case, are synonymous. Uh, or both are appropriate. Uh, but it is Philip Moriarty. Uh, he is uh, a... You know, he's British. I don't remember if it's Oxford or Cambridge or whatever. Uh, have a, a YouTube channel called 60 Symbols that he's on. Lots of good work there. Uh, I really enjoy the channel. Uh, but he has made a position that, that I disagree with wholeheartedly. And I think he doesn't understand the position at all. And I want to try to explain that to him, even though I don't think he's ever going to see this or care about it, and he's going to have some kind of stupid excuse for why uh, he doesn't agree. But I want to talk about anonymity on the internet. And if you go back and watch my first video about free speech, free speech has no cost. It is without consequence. Everything after that is some form of censored speech in some way or another. Um... one way to lower the cost of speech because our only guarantees for free speech are from in the United States and in most countries that talk about having free speech types of laws. Our only guarantee of protection is from government action, but that is not the only actors out there. Uh, if we lived in a society where I could say anything and suffer no consequences, that would be free speech, free again, is without cost. When we get into social situations, there are social costs to speech. And as long as people know who we are or what we're saying, um, that cost can have immediate and dire consequences. But there are things that sometimes need to be said that are unpopular, but are necessary for society to to progress or to move forward uh choose any revolution choose look at look at like a perfect example of anonymity in speech would be people involved in uh the the french resistance during world war ii and under nazi occupation they had to communicate they had to post information to have to try to encourage people to resist the nazis uh and had they done that with their under their real names, they would have been killed. They certainly would have been arrested, probably executed as traitors or something like that, or, or as, as spies. And that was a perfect situation where, granted, it was against government speech. People that they knew could have turned them in. Um, people that they knew that, that didn't agree with them. Maybe people, there were some French that were in favor of the Nazi occupation. But they're, they're, what they were saying was important to get out there for people to hear it, even if the source was anonymous. The other value of anonymity is that it levels the playing field uh, where what is said becomes what is important and not who is saying it. The whole... Uh, what is it? The what's that fallacy? Uh, the the fallacy from authority. It's not what it is. I can't think of what it's, the exact fallacy is, uh, or where someone takes the the authority of the speaker into account in a rational or logical argument. That someone would take uh, Doctor John Lennox's opinion of the validity of whether or not there's a God before say myself who has some college uh, 
that, that they would hold him in higher esteem on his positions because he's a doctor and is a, uh, a mathematician and has a long history of lecturing and things like that. Uh, they go before him, but his ideas on the rationality of whether or not there's a God or the Christian God in particular, they're, they're not valid. I mean, they're not as valid and that's why he, he's debated people, uh, on this topic. And when I hear his things, he's very good at obfuscating what he's actually trying to say. He occasionally makes statements that aren't quite true, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, that is the, the common apologetic argument path, uh, deflection and equivocation and things like that. His, his arguments aren't more valid because he is a, is a doctorate in math or that he's on the, uh, he's on some, some board for philosophy or something like that. I don't remember exactly what the, what the, his other title. I, I've watched two debates with him in the last couple of days. Um, it doesn't make his arguments more valid, but because you know he is a doctor, you might take his arguments to be, we might hold them in higher esteem than someone like me or some 14 year old kid uh, who just happens to have a well reasoned argument. Um, anonymity wipes out that that bias without, you know, necessarily compromising the arguments. And I understand the position that you're talking about. And I've read your blogs about, um, the peer review process. And I don't remember what the site was cause it's been about a week. And this is the fourth video. I've, I think I've started on this. Um, but your complaints about, you know, a first year student, uh, peer reviewing or challenging the work of, some tenured professor at a university and the work that he's doing, how is that valid? Other than the fact that you don't like it. If the student makes good points, um, if the student has valid objections to the way that the study is run, what's wrong with that? How is that a detriment to better science? All that does is it, is it perhaps makes them have to, you know, think that they should do better next time. It's a, Peer review is part of the improvement process of science, getting the things right that are supposed to be right, not just getting papers published. And I understand that, that a lot of professors, a lot of people in academia are required to publish material in order to, you know, keep going forward. I think that's wrong. I think that they need to, they need to revise some of those standards because I think that it, it pushes them to do work that is not necessary or not useful. Getting something done and getting it published does not necessarily make a good science. And as long as people out there who in a situation like mine, like I'm, let me explain my situation to you on YouTube. I'm skeptical root. I've got a name. I've got, uh, address, I like got family, kids, all this other kind of fun stuff that I do in real life. But on YouTube, I'm skeptical root. Why am I, why is that? Because I happen to work for a particular organization that, well, I am 100% certain would have no problem with what I'm doing here. I know that they, I happen to, well, I happen to know that I'm an atheist. They happen to know that I'm an atheist. At least my boss does. And some of my coworkers, because I've, brought it up before, uh, without any concern for that. But our primary organizational goal puts us in contact with almost exclusively religious organizations. And it is not in their best interest for an outspoken atheist to be necessarily in people's faces about what I do or what I say. So, here online as a courtesy to my employer who I, I really enjoy working for, who does really good work in our community. I am isolating them from the, the, the direct impact that it could have to know that I was on here doing this thing. 
And that anonymity is for their benefit as well as for mine. I mean, you don't need to know my background per se. If my arguments are good, then great. If my arguments aren't good, then they're, then oh, that's okay too. Challenge me on them or do a video, make a comment, something like that. I don't care. But it it distills the ideas down to whether the, to their value instead of the value they have from who they're coming from. That's the real value of anonymity and free speech. And the fact that you don't like it because it means somehow that you don't know who people are, that's too bad. That's, you shouldn't be engaging with the people who are bringing the message, but with the, the message that they have. That's what this, you know, free marketplace of ideas that, that, uh, Thunderfoot has mentioned many times is about, it's about the ideas. It's not about the people there. There are, you can do however you want to do people on the internet. Just fine. Understand that everybody, including people with anonymous, you know, names here like mine are still people. I what I'm going to say, uh, if that makes it harder for you, I'm sorry, but I don't care engage people's ideas. Uh, that's the value of this exchange here is the ideas. So, uh, I will try to find uh, a link to Philip Moriarty's blog. He prefers the blog from what I've understood. Uh, and I'll try to find the five toxic things about YouTube atheism, put those in the description. Uh, if I don't, sorry, it's already getting kind of late and I work tomorrow. So I'm a little sunburned from working out in the yard this weekend, but that's it. So that's it. Uh, hope you liked the video. Uh, if you do give it a thumbs up, uh, comment, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff that everybody always asks you to do at the end of YouTube videos. Uh, do that here, you know, uh, Constructive comments, preferably. If you want to talk about the stuff we talk about in the video, that's awesome. If you get off on a tangent uh, on something not exactly related, I'm willing to engage, but only so far. I, don't, I this I, I I do have a real life with <laughs> real things to do other than waste my time on on YouTube comments uh, that aren't going to be productive. So uh, I guess that's it. Goodbye and hello, as always. If it doesn't, 